begrüße mal alle herzlich an der GSSV, an der German International School of Silicon Valley mit Standorten in Mountain View und San Francisco. Ich sage es mal nochmal dazu, weil wir an beiden Standorten gerade wachsen, zu unserer großen Freude. Und das ist natürlich ein schöner Anlass. Die Vorlesungsreihe geht ins zweite Jahr. Ich habe nochmal überlegt an die Anfänge und es war interessanterweise eine eine, eine Veranstaltung, also eine Fragerunde, die ich moderiert habe, die organisiert war vom DWIH in New York und vom Konsulat hier in San Francisco. Und da habe ich Joanne kennengelernt und Professor Meinel war da. Und da haben wir uns hinterher gedacht, das machen wir mal weiter und mal ein bisschen wissenschaftlicher als nur so populäre äh, Frage-Antwort-Sachen. Und die DWIH-Eröffnung steht uns ja hier unmittelbar bevor. Also DWIH, Abbreviation für Deutsches Wissenschafts- und Innovationshaus, sehr deutsch, oder German Center for Research and Innovation. Ähm, wir sind im Silicon Valley und Deutschland erhofft sich davon natürlich die Vernetzung mit dem Silicon Valley. Wir als Schule hoffen sehr, dass auch wir als Schule mit einbezogen werden in dieses Netzwerk. Denn wo, wenn nicht in der Schule und wo, wenn nicht mit euch, unseren Schülern, die ihr da den amerikanischen Highschool-Abschluss macht und das deutsche Abitur, da soll es in die Zukunft gehen. Wir haben ganz gute Voraussetzungen, denke ich. Also wir sind eine ganz normale deutsche Schule, aber wir haben natürlich auch unseren Makerspace, in dem ich weiß, dass viele von euch oft sind. Wir haben einen Entrepreneur Club, wir haben Shark Tank, wir haben nicht die erste Kooperation mit dem Hasso Plattner Institut, sondern wir haben im vergangenen Jahr ganz viele Entrepreneurs interviewt und, und das aufgezeichnet, auch für Deutschland im Rahmen von Wunderbar Together. Da sind also tolle, tolle Kooperationen schon gelaufen und wir haben uns nicht von der Entfernung Potsdam, Berlin, New York und wir hatten zwischendurch auch überall sonst in der Welt. Ich glaube, wir waren in der Schweiz zu Gast, wir waren in Boston und hatten, hatten da Sprecher bei uns. Und das ist einfach eine feine Sache und wir freuen uns natürlich auch, dass das Konsulat es weiter unterstützt und heute äh, Generalkonsul Schramm da ist. Und äh, bevor ich dann übergebe an Dr. Halpen zum Vorstellen von Frank Pavicek, Frank soll ich mal sagen, äh, äh, wird, wird Oliver gleich ein paar Worte sagen. Vorher möchte ich aber noch sagen, dass ich mich auch schon, also so sehr ich mich auf heute freue, weil ich denke, Nachhaltigkeit ist was, was euch alle im Studium beschäftigen wird, was uns alle beschäftigen muss und, und noch viel, viel mehr sollte, als es schon tut, äh, freue ich mich auf die nächste Vorlesung und da wird... Joanne Herpern, die ihr alle schon online kennt, seit anderthalb Jahren bei uns sein an der Schule, also hier im MPR. Und wir haben die erste Live-Session der HPI-Vorlesungsreihe. Und zwar am 29.04. morgens, wenn abends ganz offiziell das DWIH eröffnet wird in San Francisco als sechster Standort weltweit, zweiter in den USA. Auch das zeigt die Bedeutung, die euch jetzt nicht so schwer auf den Schultern liegen, aber eure Abschlüsse, liebe, liebe Schülerinnen und Schüler. So, und jetzt übergebe ich aber an Oliver und Generalkonsul Schramm mit, seiner, mit seinen einführenden Worten. Schön, dass du da bist. Ja, ich freue mich auch sehr. Vielen Dank, liebe Katrin, für die nette Einführung. Guten Morgen an alle Zuhörerinnen und Zuhörer. Auch einen herzlichen Gruß an die Schule insgesamt, die German International School Silicon Valley, an Horst Größer und den Vorstand und alle Lehrer und alle, die heute diese nächste tolle Veranstaltung möglich gemacht haben, an Joanne Halper, Michael Koppitz, Katja Köhler, die das mit angesteuert haben und vor allem natürlich an den tollen, tollen Speaker und Gast Frank Pavlicek vom Hasso-Plattner-Institut, der, der uns äh, sicher sehr, sehr viel Interessantes äh, nachher mitbringen wird. Ähm, vielleicht noch ein Wort zu, zu Hasso-Plattner und dem Institut. Das ist wirklich etwas, was ich ähm, immer wieder mit, mit Staunen und äh, Awe and Wonder zur Kenntnis nehme, was ich da in, in, in Waldorf und dann später in Potsdam, Berlin entwickelt hat. Äh, Katrin hat ja eingangs schon von äh, der Bedeutung der, der digitalen Transformation und Hightech und, äh, und ähnlichen Dingen gesprochen. Also das ist wirklich ein Unternehmen und ein Institut, was das vorlebt und was äh, sozusagen als Zugmaschine in Deutschland vor allen Dingen ungewöhnliche und tolle und neue Wege geht und das äh, vor allen Dingen auch an viele junge Talente an viele mögliche Investoren oder vor allen Dingen Unternehmensgründer heranträgt, haben eine Digital Engineering Fakultät gegründet. Praxisnähe ist das neue Zauberwort oder gar nicht so neue Zauberwort, aber ist das gelebte Wort. Also Plattner Institut gibt es auch hier in der Region, in Palo Alto, also Plattner Institut of Design, die eng mit der D-School zusammenarbeiten. Eine Erfinderschule ist dabei. Der Frank Pavlicek kommt von der Entrepreneur School, die jetzt auch von HPI ausgegründet wurde, 
ein Businessplanwettbewerb ist, ist ausgelobt worden. Also all das freut mich sehr, freut uns hier am Generalkonsulat sehr, weil das ist, das ist etwas, was, sie, was sehr, sehr gut zusammengeht mit unserer auswärtigen Bildungs- und Kulturpolitik. Und vielleicht noch ein Wort äh, zu mir selber äh, als ehemaliger Referatsleiter für die deutschen Auslandsschulen äh, in, in, in Berlin damals. Das ist etwas, was äh, natürlich absolut spitze ist, wenn Schulen so etwas umsetzen. Wir versuchen das ja im Bereich der dualen Ausbildung, aber gerade auch, wenn es in neue Technologien geht, dann gilt äh, nach wie vor der alte, abgedroschene äh, lateinische Spruch, non scole sed vita dissimus, also weiß jeder, ne, der Latein hat ja nicht für die Schule, sondern fürs Leben lernen wir. Und das ist, glaube ich, wirklich äh, exemplarisch ähm, äh, dargestellt in dieser Zusammenarbeit, aber auch in dem, was das HPI tut und was das HPI hoffentlich dann auch an Fallout äh, an der Deutschen Auslandsschule hier in Silicon Valley generiert. Ich erinnere auch noch an die Initiative Schulcloud des hasso plattner instituts die ja jetzt ausgelaufen ist, aber in weiteren Bundesländern übernommen werden, worden ist äh, und das weiter voranbringt. Also du hast das DWIH erwähnt, das German Center of Science Innovation, das sechste weltweit. All dies sind natürlich unsere Bemühungen und auch die der neuen Bundesregierung jetzt, äh, möglichst viel Austausch zu schaffen, möglichst viel Plattform für Begegnung und, und Wissensvermittlung. Und das ist, glaube ich, auch für junge Menschen, die jetzt kurz vorm Schulabschluss stehen oder schon in Richtung Beruf schauen, sehr, sehr wichtig, einfach die Informationen zu bekommen und auch Ideen zu bekommen und Perspektiven zu entwickeln und vor allen Dingen auch den Mut äh, mitzubekommen, äh, das gemeinsam vielleicht, gemeinsam vielleicht etwas, etwas Neues zu entwickeln. Und dafür sind diese Wettbewerbe und Hasso Plattner und das, was die Schule gemeinsam und die Schulen auch weltweit gemeinsam tun, sehr, sehr wichtig. Also es sind wirklich die beiden die beiden Punkte, die aus meiner Sicht da ganz zentral sind. Einmal, dass man ähm, vermittelt bekommt, was Praxis und Beruf sein kann, über das, was man vielleicht selber auch aus der Familie mitbringt. Und vor allen Dingen, äh, und, und äh, last but not least, äh, eben in vielen, vielen Bereichen, wo Hightech und Digital und Artificial Intelligence eine ganz, ganz wichtige Rolle in unserem heutigen Leben spielt. Und das geht bis hin zu aktuellen Krisen, wie jetzt in der Ukraine, wenn es um Cyber Security geht und Ähnliches. Also das sind nicht nur tolle Jobs oder tolle Ideen und Aufgaben, sondern auch ganz wichtige und ganz, ganz zukunftsschaffende Dinge, die da entwickelt werden. Insofern finde ich es ganz toll, dass diese Initiative und diese gemeinsame Vorlesungsreihe mit HPI weitergeht äh, und ähm, hoffentlich ganz, ganz viele, ähm, wie soll ich sagen, Aha-Momente beinhaltet und auch ähm, dann vielleicht in die eine oder andere äh, Berufsentscheidung oder auch praktische Entwicklung dann mündet. Ähm, ich wünsche allen ganz, ganz viel Spaß bei dieser Veranstaltung und äh, gebe zurück an Joanne. Vielen Dank. Thank you so much, Oliver. We're going to move to English now. And um, thank you, Oliver and Kathleen, for your wonderful introductions. And really, you really are sharing what HPI is about. And you're not, you know, so, so thank you for doing that. We really appreciate it. Also, it's been an excellent uh, collaboration with both of you. And I'm looking forward to seeing both of you at the end of April in person. And to the students and to Frank. First, to Frank, thank you for taking the time to speak with the students today. I'm going to introduce Frank briefly in a minute. And to the students, welcome again. And I look forward to seeing you also at the end of April. So now, just a brief introduction today to today's um, today to today's speaker. Um, so Frank, Dr. Frank Pavlicek is the director of the School of Entrepreneurship at Hasso Plattner Institute. And before he joined HPI in 2020, he founded Ubitricity, the Berlin-based company that develops solutions for charging and smart grid integration of electric cars to limit climate change. And Frank's entrepreneurial spirit was sparked as a high school student and as a college student by many stays in Silicon Valley. And he just told us a few minutes ago, he really feels at home in Silicon Valley. And there as a software developer, he was fascinated by the startup ecosystem. Before founding his own company, Frank first completed a legal education in Mainz, Frankfurt, San Francisco, and, and in Auckland, New Zealand, which he finished with a doctorate and international master's degree. He then worked for several years as a lawyer in leading international and national law firms, where he advised large and medium-sized companies, primarily in the high-tech sector. And Frank is also president of the Berlin Brandenburg Energy Network and mentors young founders. And Frank, we are so happy to have you here with us. And I will now give the floor to you. 
Joanne, thank you very, very much for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, Oliver, um, I, I, I couldn't have described what HPI is about better. <laughs> yeah, so I will, I will be able to keep that quite brief. Um, thank you very much. And, and again, thank you very much for having me here. Yeah, um, in, in our short introduction, I already said, told everyone here yeah, that I think this is an extremely, extremely valuable format and the exchange um between not only hpi and and uh, the schools in, in silicon valley but between cultures continents and and broadening uh, your your own um attitude and and thinking uh, in terms of what is possible if we collaborate to make a difference is really so important and uh, as joanne just pointed out um my personal journey was coined a lot by the fact that I was able to, to spend a lot of time in, in Silicon Valley, not like you living there, but uh, spending my summer breaks over there. I was flashed and very much um, led into the direction to at some point follow an own idea. It took some while, yeah, we'll talk about that later, uh, until that idea actually occurred yeah, and uh, I could follow it. But uh, the, the spark to follow an own idea, the uh, confidence to, to do so, that was really set in, in, in the Silicon Valley in the, in the early 90s. Um, so um, it's great to be here. And uh, I have the big pleasure to talk a little bit about uh, what I think uh, is about uh, one of the most important topics of our time about how to enable impact to, to solve problems and challenges we are facing as a society and um, as a planet. And uh, so I will briefly share my my screen with you. Uh, hold on a sec. Uh, there we go. Um, and I will I will embed a, a little bit my, my personal story in, in what I'm talking about uh, to you today. Um, as, as Jan already highlighted, um, I'm here at uh, Hasso Platter Institute leading the, the School of Entrepreneurship. Um, the e school <coughs> or uh, School of Entrepreneurship is here to inspire and educate and mainly to support everyone here at HPI or our alumni um, and partners in the ecosystem on how to execute ideas. Uh, into scaling products and ventures, because we think that it is really important that we not only have a very practical focused education in, in IT engineering, uh, digital engineering here, but to give people an idea of what they can move forward if they know how to use these technologies and to create impact um, through great products and ventures, basically. And uh, talking about making an impact. Yeah, um, this talk today is about enabling entrepreneurial impact. And I hope yeah, if uh, there is a chance to take you with me on a mutual mission that we created here, um, because I think following an own idea and making a difference in this world is much easier if you know that you're not alone, but that you're part of a mission. And this mission uh, is called Mission E. Um, why it is E, you will learn it in a second. Yeah, uh, we created this mission as like an overall mission, uh, as an objective of why we are here. And uh, this is not only about HPI, and it's not only about uh, creating products and ventures as at, at, uh, here at HPI. It's a much huger movement uh, where practically everyone sharing the idea behind it uh, is, is very welcome to participate, to, to get in touch, to network, to mingle, because I think we cannot afford to not make a difference these days and not collaborate with each other in making this difference. And so my main mission today is to make you part of Mission E um, and to explain what that means. Um, it is about, well, obviously our earth and our society to a certain degree, our economy as well, um, because we really at this time face enormous challenges and um, to preserve 
the life foundations for future generations, we really need to address these challenges and we need not to address them in the way former generations did, but we need to address them in a sustainable and yet scalable way. And the mission E is about a world where everyone based on her or his own potential um, is encouraged and empowered to play the best possible role in sustaining and continuously improving our society and the living conditions. So this is basically, you could say, the vision of uh, what, what we created and where we want to encourage everyone to play a role. And our mission is to increase the number of talents, of excellent talents to become the pioneers of the 21st century and to develop and to follow and mainly to execute ideas to achieve one clear goal that is enabling the impact of the idea that you have for our planet, society and economy by transferring these ideas into scalable technologies, product and organ products and organizations. Yeah, so mission E is about execution of ideas and learning how to do that, being confident that you can make this difference and that you have all the toolings um, required, the network. And uh, our belief here at HPI is that everyone who is an innovator and has the talent to move things forward needs to make such a difference if somehow possible at least so we want to ignite everyone to make such a difference and uh, we believe not only in talents so in you but we believe in ecosystems as well because no one can make this challenge alone uh, uh, can address challenges alone but uh, we bring together people we bring together students with startups um, students with corporates, um, different students from different universities, um, students from high schools together with um, students from, from the universities. Um, and so we create, based on Mission E, an ecosystem to address the challenges I was just pointing out and to enable collaboration within this ecosystem. And, uh, well, at the third point, obviously, we believe in the impact of technologies. It's not only about digital technologies, but here at HPI, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, it's a lot about digital technologies. I mean, we are one of the places here in Europe, I would say, one of the most unique places where you can learn how to use digital technologies to apply them and to make them a basis for the impact you can achieve. And we try to bring this together, obviously. So finally, why is it called Mission E? Well, originally, I have to admit, we are School of Entrepreneurship, uh, which is eSchool. So the E plays a dominant role because of entrepreneurship. But in the end, E is not about entrepreneurship alone. It's E is a placeholder. And it symbolizes for us some really important core elements. It's about Earth. It's here in this environment, a lot about Europe. Um, it's about ecology, economy, to me mainly, to be honest, about execution. Yeah, because if you want to make a difference, you need to know how to execute your ideas. Otherwise, they will just vanish. Um, it's about excellence. It's about ecosystems, entrepreneurships, and you can add whatever you like. Yeah, it's a placeholder, uh, but we think it, it combines a lot of what it takes to make this difference and to bring forward um, our society. Uh, towards the challenges we are addressing. So the question is, why did I join the mission? Um, well, we, we created and joined the mission. And I personally would say I joined the mission long before I even know that we would create this mission E as a mission um, by getting inspired that it is possible to move things forward and that you can make a difference by following an own idea. And as Joanne pointed out, I was really lucky because neighbors of us were moving to Silicon Valley and they invited me to stay over the summer break for six weeks. Um, 
And I did that in, in four, I think, consecutive summers. So I regularly spent time there software developing uh, a little bit together with freelancers and in, in smaller and mid-sized companies. And I, for the first time, realized how much impact you can have if you just do things, if you're not afraid to fail. But if you say there is an idea, I think it's the right idea and I will try it. And if I do not try, I obviously will never find out whether it is the right idea. So I just try. And if I do it three times, four times, five times, trying an idea, um, I learn each and every time a lot. And this point of not being afraid to fail of following an own idea that was clearly created when I, when I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. And after that, it took a long time in my personal story until I started to actually follow an own idea because I was somehow lacking an idea I thought is worth following. But in 2005, um, when I met in an office, a guy, talking a lot about renewable energies and about climate change and that we need to do something against climate change, we started to think, okay, what can we do to, in the end, make it possible that these little animals or large animals here have a perspective in future? And um, well, as, as Joanne already pointed out, we were in a somehow awkward position because we both met at a law firm um, we were both working as M&A attorneys, and um, so the, the typical way would have been to, I don't know, um, um, make a difference in climate change, be like a scientist and, and work on that and, and do things. And we thought, okay, well, as lawyers, it's maybe not always easy to make this difference. We, we, we thought there need to be a different impact. And then we started to think what kind of solution would it take to do something against climate change. So we started with a why, what can we do against climate change? And we ask ourselves, okay, what does it take to get closer to 100% renewable energy generation worldwide? Um, because we thought that this is at least one important part of the puzzle, not to use oil and gas anymore, but to power the earth based on wind, sun and water, basically. And the big problem in many countries, at least, is that you can build more and more and more solar and wind and things uh, to produce renewable energies, but it's fluctuating. And during night, during the time when no wind and no sun is available, you still need electricity. So to make this possible, you need storage. And uh, the, the core element of what we were focusing on was storage. And uh, then we ask ourselves the questions, okay, how can we get enough storage to the grid um, coming with a business case? And we ended up after a lot of different technologies we were looking at, at the fact that the best storage would be the storage that was bought by the user for a totally different purpose, but can still be used for the storage of renewable energies. And uh, so we ended up in 2007, that if we would have enough electric vehicles in future, that we would have a lot of mobile storage that was actually bought to drive around, but that is typically parking 22 to 23 hours per day. And if we manage to somehow connect this storage in an intelligent way to the power grid for these 22 hours and bring down the cost for this connection, um, to create a business case that we can really attribute a lot. Well, that was 2007, and this car here obviously was only built five years later. Um, and so the, the big problem was there was not a single electric vehicle uh, from a single car manufacturer at this time, but we still decided that because of some big mega trends worldwide, um, that now must be the time where electric mobility plays, starts playing a dominant role. Yeah. And uh, so in 2008, we decided to quit our jobs as lawyers and started in an empty office, a company called UV Tricity. Yeah, and that's deriving from ubiquitous and electricity because it was about creating 
well, affordable, cheap charge spots, connection points to the power grid at each and every place where cars are parking for a longer time. And to create a business case around that, we decided that we will not follow an approach that works a little bit like the, the today's petrol stations where you have like some central places with a lot of technology installed, a lot of payment infrastructure behind it, but that we follow more or less the approach that we know from this device, that you have one intelligent mobile device, which is basically your car yeah, that already contains a lot of electronics and uh, a lot of services like communication services and so on, and that we reduce the charging spots to pure docking stations without a lot of electronics, a lot of uh, without services, and to reduce the capex, so the investment costs, and the opex, the operation costs, to an absolute minimum, so that it doesn't hurt if the car is overnight at home and during the day at work. And if you are at work, the overnight uh, the the socket at home does not incur any operating costs. And if you are uh, overnight at home, the socket at um, the workplace is not incurring at any operating costs because operating costs are always bundled with a mobile electricity contract to your car. And we use the complete car electronics to enable the authentication, do the communication, uh, basically do the billing. And the whole logic is designed from a mobile per mobile perspective because because the asset that it's about to commercialize is mobile. It's a big battery within the car. So that was the idea of Ubitricity, integrating sort of a mobile metering module. Metering is a, a regulatory accepted measuring of e electricity. Yeah, So you need to put this all into regulation. We were not so afraid about regulatory issues because as two lawyers, um, we knew how to discuss with the German federal ministries about making room and regulation for such a technology. That wasn't very simple, but it worked. And uh, then we started in 2008. And we, as lawyers, had to make a lot of proof points before the market actually was willing to trust us. So we did a lot of partnering together with smaller and bigger companies together with research bodies from the German government. And at the end of our first project, the technology looked like that. Um, because there wasn't a car uh, where we could integrate the technology that was far too early. We said, okay, we, we still need the whole technology to be mobile. And so we integrated it in that charging cable because charging cables in Europe, at least, are not mounted to the chargers but are part of the car. Yeah, they are typically in the trunk or in the trunk or somewhere, and you bring it. And then we said, okay, we are not yet integrating it, but we bring it. And so in that cable, you see the mobile metering module in the smart cable um, doing authentication. You, know, you just plug it in. Uh, the cable identifies then the identification number of the socket. It uh, then establishes a communication a link to the backend asks for permission to unlock the socket. And if the permission is granted, the socket is unlocked. The electricity is metered by the smart cable and then directly built to the user. And whenever you're not using that simple socket, it does not incur any cost. So that was the idea. And we did a lot wrong, unfortunately, because we thought we will be able to introduce this totally new idea about how to think electricity, not from the grid, but from the car side, um, in one step. And uh, well, what we learned is that the world was not waiting for that technology because everyone said, we are not doing that in electricity. Electricity is always thought from the grid. And um, so in the end, yeah, that was one of our biggest um, blockers to introduce this technology and there would have been a lot of better ways from an ex post view to introduce the technology. Yeah, so a lot of learnings, a lot of failure uh, we, we did. Um, but to a certain degree, we were able to 
push the technology to the market. And then in 2012, something happened that completely changed the history of the company because we ask ourselves, okay, at home, at work, it's simple if you have access to private parking to install such a socket, yeah, to put the cable in the trunk, provide the user with two sockets, one for home, one for workplace. And if you have an own garage or at least access to private parking, not a big problem to install it and to use it. And we had a lot of different use cases of fleet operators, um, of uh, corporate cars and so on, uh, using this technology. But in Germany and the US as well, um, in cities, larger cities, around 60 to 70% of all um, cars are not parking on private premises, but in public space. And so we ask ourselves, okay, how can we create our very slim charge spot in public space without incurring a lot of cost? And we were walking up and down the roads, and at some point we said, okay, well, the only place where electricity is already existing in public space um, and where someone already uh, drilled a hole down to the mains, to the power grid, um, are in fact light poles. Um, and then we said, well, well, maybe we have a chance to somehow package our socket technology in a way that it completely fits into a light pole because it is from the electronic side quite small because all the electronics are basically used either by the car side or by the smart cable and so it's not taking a lot of room and then we borrowed one of the doors yeah the maintenance doors of a berlin light pole and um, tried to build a prototype from our electronics to fit it behind the door and then we pushed the door back into the light pole we did not connect it to the power grid just tried to fit it somehow in there and what can i say it worked yeah and uh, one day later there was in a person from der spiegel uh, visiting us about doing an interview about how the german car makers are blocking electric mobility because they want to stick with combustion engines and so on and uh, he wanted to make an interview about how easy it could be to roll out charging infrastructure how cheap it could be and he wanted to know what we are doing and well we told him about this picture that you see here um, about our approach and he said well yeah 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 nice 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 but what else could we talk about and then we showed him that prototype of our light pole charger um, that was installed down at the road and uh, at this time we had um, an, an, a car and that was not even an electric car originally, but that was converted from a combustion car into an electric car. And uh, he said, well, can we connect it? And we said, yeah, we could connect it. It will not work because it's not connected. And he said, ah, I don't care. It's still making a great photo. And then he took that photo. And one week later, that was the headline photo at uh, this article. And the, the article was called the second life of the light pole. And that was the time when we started to receive criminal or that we, when we were prosecuted by the state of berlin for for abusing the light poles yeah, which we didn't obviously knowing what we do but um well that was the beginning of a story and i will show you how that looked like in berlin yeah that was one of the first light poles charger in berlin that we installed and uh, this year is our blue car and the article yeah, um, in, 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 in Der Spiegel. And the problem of this picture is that if you see it and the simplicity of just tapping off electricity from a light pole, that you do not get this picture out of your head ever again. And we did not manage after 2012 and this picture to ever get back Ubitricity to the mobile metering company. From this article on, Ubitricity was the light pole charging company. And uh, we did a lot to always explain that it's not about light poles, but that this is just the place in public space where we can use our technology to tap off electricity. But everyone was referring now 
to the light pole company and well this was light pole number three at some point it's directly in front of the german automobile makers association vda um, in berlin mitte and um, well it was deliberately done at this place somehow in an overnight movement as well um, because we wanted to show the German car makers that it is possible to, to scale charging infra in, uh, infrastructure in Germany. And um, well, from this point, we, we pushed mobile metering technology, but everyone reduced us to the light pole. And that stayed until the rest of, I would say, the company's life and still stays on because everyone was asking, can we do that? Uh, and in Germany, we failed to uh, interesting enough to to scale the technology because we liked it the customers liked it but regulators and in particular cities didn't like it because a lot of huge companies who instead liked to sell um the the charging stations for 15000k um and to put them on they tried to block it because they said, well, it's not possible to do that. It's not allowed to do that. Uh, there are a lot of disadvantages. And um, as the, the municipalities strongly collaborated with the large companies, um, it was really hard to get grip in, in Germany. And um, for eight years, uh, we only managed to install around 50 of these chargers in, in all over Berlin. Although we acquired a lot of funding from the German governments uh, uh, for installing up to 1,000, Berlin said, no, nah, we are not doing it. Um, and in 2015, after not being able to scale it in Germany, we started to look for different opportunities. and. Just today, I had a coaching with one of our teams here at HPI um, talking about not sticking to your own country, to your own ecosystem, but thinking beyond. Um, we said, okay, well, let's try it in a different country. And we started to try it in London. London, because of a lot of money investment wise, um, that is located over there. And uh, a lot of efforts of the city to become a clean city um, and to push electric mobility. And um, funny enough, different than in Germany, they loved it. And after only some weeks, we had already the first 100 equipped of these 19th century light poles that you see here in, in London. Um, and there was like a competition between the boroughs, the districts in London about who can fit in some beautiful environment, which light pole first, yeah? And, and then there started a movement. And um, by then we, we had already uh, a, quite a number of, of shareholders. And one of our shareholders was uh, Siemens. And together with Siemens, we started to scale the technology in London. And different from what happened in, in Berlin, uh, in London, District started to retrofit with our technology like whole streets of light poles because they did not want to reserve the parking um, bay in front of uh, the light pole. But they said, okay, no, that's then triggering a lot of uh, problems because people say whoever is able to afford an electric vehicle now is getting another benefit because of a reserved parking place. And this is where they retrofitted like whole streets. Um, because they said, well, then everyone has access to, to uh, electricity wherever he parks. Yeah? And the great thing is the cost for retrofitting such a light pole in London uh, is about 1,000 euro. And the cost for a charging station that you would build uh, here on the roadside is about 15,000 euro. So they could retrofit 15 light poles for the price of one charging station. And that was enough as an argument for a lot of uh, the companies. And um, in, in short time, London was looking like that. Yeah, um, so we started from, from the center of London with the, in, the, in the more 
well rich areas with a lot of uh, potential for because i mean the first buyers of cars bought like teslas and and other very expensive cars and so they were living in the in the center of london and um well in the end yeah, i think last week we crossed the the 5000 charger mark in in london so we we became the largest supplier of and operator of charging infrastructure in the city and um no one, really no one was interested in our mobile metering technology anymore. Yeah, everyone said, okay, we need light pole chargers. What kind of light pole charger can you supply us? But, well, in the end, the idea was to do something against climate change and to create a technology that makes sure that you can build more and more access to storage. And uh, funny enough, last week, last week, Finally, yeah, um, even Berlin started now to install tech the technology. As you can see, they decided to go for a bigger approach um, because they, they uh, mandatory require a charger that contains a lot of technology stationary as well. This is the reason why it is so big. Um, and now they started to do the first 200 and there will be another 800 in the second step. And as you can see on the upper left side, the company is not longer owned by the 10 shareholders that it was owned by in, in 2019 and 2020, but um, we, we sold the company in the end to Shell uh, as part of their CO2 strategy to scale the technology and to roll it out all over Europe. Um, it is in the end, a story with a, uh, a laughing and a not so much laughing eye because um, the beauty of the technology with regard to mobile metering yeah, somehow got stuck. But the beauty of scaling a technology that really makes a difference in terms of um, providing renewable energy to, to electric vehicles and enables that a car, even in public space, can be connected the 12 hours overnight and may be uh, a, a part of a distributed energy system for, for example, overnight with a lot of wind energy. Um, well, that was fulfilled. Yeah, so a lot of positive and negative experiences, a lot of learnings. And that was the reason why I thought it is really important to inspire a lot of other people, a lot of other young people to think about what kind of difference they can make because if we as two lawyers could after 10 years make this difference um, and, and this technology was like worldwide acknowledged it's it's installed in china it was we we won the the um, climate x challenge of the the uh, city of the city of new york with that uh, approach if we as two lawyers could make this difference what difference can you make if you start even a little bit earlier, if you focus a little bit earlier about what you can do, if you acquire what you need in terms of knowledge, if you say, okay, I'm more going towards engineering, be it digital or mechanical or electronic engineering or towards um, the, the economic side or whatever. Yeah, so there, everyone can make a difference. And uh, it's just the question, do you have a strong why and do you stick to your personal idea and to your vision and, and uh, mission? And the good news is you became part of the Mission E already by just being open to listen to this talk and to being part of the schools you are in Silicon Valley, being part of that surroundings. Um, because I'm, I'm very, very sure that you have a really... Um, unique environment already otherwise you wouldn't be part of such a format yeah um, and uh, it's now on you to stay tuned and maybe not to start immediately today to think about what you can change but to keep in mind that you can make this change and that you go down a way where you really make a difference because you can this is my my most important mission i really want to encourage you to always keep in mind that you can make this difference and uh, very much important you are not alone 
Um, and what I will tell you over the next three to four minutes um, is what we offer at HPI. But this is just one place. There are numerous great places where you really get a lot of support of not only inspiration, but a lot of support on how to execute ideas, how to maybe, for example, found a startup to grow the startup and um, take this take this help, this support, um, make yourself part of an ecosystem where this is happening. It's incredibly inspiring to see how many people are working on ideas and what's possible and uh, stick to your dreams, to your ideas and to make it part of an impact that you can contribute to address and tackle the challenges uh, of our current century. Um, HPI, um, when I was asked <coughs> whether I would be willing to take over the School of Entrepreneurship, I had to have to admit a new HPI as one of the, the few really outstanding places in Germany um, where you can not only study information sciences, but where you can get a great education in digital engineering. So very practical focused. Um, and I knew about the School of Design Thinking because I had the pleasure to work with a lot of people who did the basic or advanced track here at HPI and Design Thinking. But uh, I, I had to get a little bit deeper in the understanding of how unique this place really is. And the great thing is what you can learn here is really outstanding in, in the quality of the education, um, in meeting other people, great talents, and HPI is committed to really address pressing challenges of our society by following a very practical approach uh, with regard to digital engineering, innovation, design, and entrepreneurship. And um, it's a, yeah, it's a really, it's a pleasure working and uh, living somehow in this ecosystem and uh, meet outstanding people and hopefully help them to become the makers and innovators of tomorrow. And our very own entrepreneurship ecosystem, which we are creating and, and growing yeah, step by step consists obviously of HPI and digital engineering, um, the, the digital engineering faculty with a lot of um, students and a lot of PhDs and postdocs and professors. And we do have at the moment uh, 24 professors here at HPI. Um, 22 of them are uh, digital engineering professors in the field of AI, in the field of machine learning, algorithm engineering, digital health, um, cybersecurity, you name it. Yeah, so just a lot of that. And um, we as School of Entrepreneurship, we are not only working with all of these different disciplines, but um, we are a link to other ecosystems as well. Yeah, so we work together with business schools. Yeah, we form um, offers and programs where we bring together people. And I'm also managing director of HPI Seed, which is our cultivator for startups. Um, and uh, it's basically a, a fund to, to do first time investments for very young teams. Um, we, 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 we have our startup ecosystem in, in our rooms, um, right over. Uh, right behind me, actually, yeah, uh, where our startups are located on campus, because we think we shouldn't um, rip apart uh, startups and, and students because they are great role models and they hire a lot of our students as working students. Um, and so it's a it's a very, very fruitful collaboration of, of founding here at HPI. And um, obviously, we have a lot of partners and we bring together these partners with all our students and startups in, in a network, in a curated network. And what we developed here now um, is a very uh, systematic approach, a founder curriculum, basically, um, that you can, can not have to, yeah, attend um, based on your personal situation. So if you, for example, say, okay, I'm in general interested in, in following an own idea, yeah, you can choose one of our inspiration or education formats 
um, like the classic things like an open house, startup talks, failure nights um, uh, for uh, innovate, uh, PhDs, um, the PhD to innovative formats. And we have, for example, now programs like Founder Fundamentals, which is a lecture about the most important tool sets you require as a founder. Um, we, we just create uh, a new summer school that's called how to be a startup CTO because a lot of our students end up in this role if they found or if they will work in a startup. Um, and we do that together with um, CTOs from the, the Berlin startup ecosystem with a lot of experiences. Um, and then we have the maker part of our curriculum. It's about learning how to nail down an idea to test it to transfer it into a prototype um, to build great digital products and uh, in the end to build great ventures around these products so we have a product builder program which we do for uh, in this year for the first time together with the Handelshochschule Leipzig with the HHL a business school um, in, in in Germany and uh, we create the venture builder program uh, to to start in the in the next semester as an incubation program for our teams um, at the end of this program hopefully a lot of the teams are not all, not only encouraged and convinced but uh, will then directly receive the funding from hpi seed um, shift over from this new building where we are here into the building uh, behind me in our uh, startup community and uh, then they receive a lot of uh, support to work towards the most pressing milestones to receive more funding, um, build market traction, because we have a lot of network. And uh, yeah, the, the yellow, yellow program offers, we do not uh, only with uh, the School of Entrepreneurship, but we support a lot of our um, professors um, in building programs that are much closer to practical um, products and instead of just thinking in technologies, so we have uh, our AI in practice and applied cybersecurity um, formats. Um, we have a global team-based innovation that we uh, support and the design thinking, basic and advanced tricks are supported. So we always look together with the design thinking teams, whether you can make more out of this idea in terms of a product or a venture. Um, and we have two awards, one best idea award, where the, the best idea of HPI uh, will be premiered um, and awarded. Um, that's a low level award to, to make people dare uh, putting their ideas on the table because a lot of people, a lot of uh, in, uh, the, the students have ideas, but do not really dare to say, okay, this is, is could this be something? Yeah, so we try to, set an incentive here. And then obviously we have our classic business plan competition. If you have a team already, if you have a prototype and you can pitch and then you can receive up to 1000 euros um, as part of the business plan competition. Yeah, so this is what we are doing um, to give you sort of an, an image about how this is looking like. Yeah, um, these are some pictures from ecosystem parts we have uh, at HPI, at the Hasselblad Foundation, the, the top picture in the middle is, uh, has been taken at the, the building of Hasselblad Foundation. Um, this is our, um, our acceleration um, uh, dojo. And it's, a, it's a small accelerator with all our uh, participating teams. And um, yeah, this is us um, at HPI. Quite a number of startups were created already, um, depending on how you count something between 150 and 200. Um, quite a number of jobs have been created before they have been exited. Last year, we just had a great exit of Signavio uh, as a unicorn. Um, and uh, so we hope obviously to encourage a lot of different others to, to start up here at HPI. And um, this is basically it, I hope. I hope it was uh, maybe the the start of your personal journey, not so much about, um, hold on, so here we go, um, about just just do something, but to, to understand how much you can move and how much you can decide about where to go now after finishing school 
um, where you learn a lot about how to make a difference. Yeah, it would be a pleasure to stay in, in touch when, if you should think about studying in, in Germany um, in an international environment, international network, you're always very, very welcome to apply here, obviously, at HPI and uh, to work with us. But I'm very sure um, coming from Silicon Valley, you will have a lot of opportunities to make that difference. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And if you like, um, you obviously can, can raise a lot of questions now. Thanks a lot.